Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I'm going to kick this video off discussing the Ryzen processors of the Zen 4 variety and also RDNA 3, specifically the release dates of these upcoming products. According to Vegeta on Twitter, who has successfully leaked uh, roadmaps in the past, so I will of course link that account in the video description, we will see both of these line of products launch pretty much simultaneously, and this will happen in Q4 2022. Furthermore, tape out of RDNA 3 will take place this year, late this year to be more specific. And yeah, RDNA 3 has had a ton of leaks already, and I've gone over a lot of performance targets and RDNA 3 is seemingly going to be ridiculously good. Um, I've already put out a video stating that I've heard at least 2.5 times and one source is telling me 2.7, although it is worth noting that there are still some who are telling me that these performance targets are not realistic and it could be more like a two times increase. Personally, I'm still leaning towards the higher numbers just because I've been told it by so many who have been very accurate previously, but of course, until we actually get products in our hands or AMD officially, you know, tell us the information, you should always take this stuff with grains of salt. However, getting back to the release schedule, I also have to say that I'm kind of surprised we won't see RDNA 3 launch until Q4. Again, I was told it was going to be earlier in 2022, but it's possible there has been some delays during the bring up process of the silicon and to be honest with you this would not be new um, rdna1 definitely was a challenge for amd and to be honest with you i don't really think that any company is in a super rush right now to release any products it's also possible that my information was just simply inaccurate for the first half of the year although the person who told me that was looking at roadmaps so again maybe some things have changed Either way, another very interesting thing that I've been hearing about RDNA 3 is that the actual IO die itself between the chiplets actually acts as like the, the cache. So I'm sure most of you are aware by now that RDNA 2 has the infinity cache, which is 128 megabytes or less, depending on the SKU you're going for. Well, I've been hearing from multiple people now, and also this rumor was doing the rounds on Twitter a while back anyway, that the IO die itself not only, well, does things that IO dies do, i.e. facilitates communication with um, the host CPU and of course, you know, make, uh, the actual frame buffer. So let's just say it's got 16 gigabytes of RAM. It, obviously the chiplets themselves would communicate via that. But furthermore, that you would also see 256 megabytes of cache basically embedded in this IO die. And this could possibly be one of the reasons that we've been seeing, you know, some of the patents that have emerged for RDNA 3. At the end of the day, I have no block diagram personally. So I would take this with a huge grain of salt, quite frankly. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation we could do, but I don't think it's quite the place for it in a news video, especially as I've got a product briefing in like 20 minutes from now by, <laughs> by someone. So I'm like, I'm going to record really quickly. Um, but yeah, I have to say that I am very interested to see actually how AMD have put uh, Narvo 31 and 32 together. Those are the ones that I'm hearing are going to be multi-chip designs with Narvo 33 possibly going to be monolithic. And the performance targets of 33 are still going to be really good. I suspect, and again, none of this is official, so I would really stress huge grains of salt, but I've been hearing that it could be 30-40% greater for Narvo 33 versus Narvo um, Narve 21, which again would be like the 6800, 6900 XT. And if that is accurate, if we are looking at those type of uh, performance numbers, I'll be A, very curious to see what actually AMD's marketing strategy is, and B, what the pricing is, and I guess the, the third logical one as well, is what AMD, you know, will actually see in terms of product sales because let's assume just for one moment that the numbers are accurate let's be somewhat pessimistic though but reasonably you know let's just be kind of split the difference and say that Narvo 33 is 
20%, 30% faster. And this is not ray tracing performance, by the way, to be clear, this is standard rasterization. If it's true, and the GPU is, let's say, 30% faster than a 6900 XT, that's a lot of power. Like, okay, games will be more demanding, but that GPU, surely in like a year and a half or whatever, it's going to easily be able to tear through 1440p. So it'd, it'd be very interesting to see how the marketing slash the uh, pricing would actually translate to that. But again, there's a lot more I can say on this matter, and maybe I'll put out a video in the not too distant future. I'm finishing a review and have a briefing to attend in a minute, so I just wanted to quickly put that out there. But um, furthermore, there is a very interesting thing from Camp Microsoft. So of course, with AMD, they are heavily pushing FSR, Fidelity FX Super Resolution, and this is part of their GPU Open initiative. Long story short, uh, AMD wants to put out software where basically you can download it and then incorporate it into your game and it would work on different architectures. So for example, you could adjust the code and it would run on an NVIDIA GPU. And of course, AMD have actually shown FSR already running on a GTX 1060. Furthermore, a lot of AMD's tech has also found its way into the Xbox and the PlayStation. And there's a very interesting set of uh, comments from Microsoft that they are finding FSR to be very tasty. At Xbox, we're excited by the potential of AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution technology as another great method for developers to increase frame rates and resolution. We'll have more to share on this soon. End quote. This was a very short statement to IGN. There's not a whole load there. But it is worth noting that this is only one method you can upscale the image. AMD have put out a few numbers and kind of bits of information regarding FSR, but it's not been as comprehensive as perhaps we'd like. But then again, of course, the technology is yet to be released. So they're possibly doing a few last minute tweaks here and there. So I'll be very interested to test it out um, on both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Like I have to say, uh, given now we know that it's gonna run on, let's say the Polaris 400 series, I'd be interested to test it on that. Maybe RDNA 1, uh, a 6800 XT as well, a couple of GeForce cards, just to see how the performance targets are at different resolutions, quality settings versus DLSS and stuff like that. But that comment from Microsoft, I do think is quite interesting. Now, I don't think that Microsoft, that is Xbox with the Series X and S, are going to push it as their primary means of upscaling for every single title. And of course, the reality is that Microsoft are also working on their own upsampling technology and they've been doing pretty well. You know, we even saw this really being debuted in with uh, Forza, Forza, I think it was Horizon, but I might be wrong on that. Uh, and this was like running on a GeForce card back in the day and they were kind of showing it running on tensor cores. And I discussed this a lot in my uh, upsampling focused video. So I'll try to remember to link that in the video description. And you know, with machine learning capabilities of the next generation Xbox and PlayStation, it's really cool to see what we could actually get from games. However, this is definitely a very casual type of scenario. And the fact is that this can work very easily for games developers without needing to really kind of target specific hardware. Again, FSR can even work on really old architectures such as Polaris. I also wonder what would be the state of affairs with the older consoles like Microsoft and AMD seem to be only pushing it for the newer consoles. And obviously the older consoles don't necessarily, at least their base consoles don't have like Polaris base. So Xbox One is prior to Polaris. However, the uh, Xbox One X is essentially Polaris based. So that I do find also quite interesting. I think the future is definitely going to be upsampling. Like we saw, um, of course, comments now from Insomniac that Ratchet and Clank is going to be pushing kind of higher quality uh, modes, yes, where you can have like higher quality but uh, lower frame rates, or you can even have higher frame rate modes with ray tracing, but of course the internal resolution is going to be lower. And, um, you know, games like Horizon have also been pushing, you know, reconstruction technology. So definitely that for a console makes a ton of sense. So this is just another tool in developers' arsenals, which is obviously only ever a good thing to give developers a lot of additional, you know, 
basically it never hurts to have additional uh, options when creating a game with that said though thank you very much for checking out the video i'm going to see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now